It's showtime. Hello, Internet. I'm called Matt. Uh, welcome back to Matt Presents, the show where I talk about the movie nights I hold, or the movies I show at the movie nights I hold. This week, we followed up on a film we watched last week. We watched House 2, The Second Story from 1987. The perfect fucking sequel title, okay? House 2, The Second Story. It, it's, it's a double layer pun you know it's it's like it's it's well no i guess it's just a regular pun but it's like because it's the second story it's an anthology sequel to the first film it doesn't uh, it doesn't bring back any of the same characters um so it is it's a it's a second story but you know the second floor of a house is called the second story brilliant title the 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 perfect sequel title I, I can't think of a, of a sequel with a better title. Maybe that should have been my question last week. What's what's the best sequel title? We'll, we'll save that one. We'll stick that one in our pockets and use it, you know, the week I decide to show Break In 2 Electric Boogaloo. I have no idea why Electric Boogaloo became the go-to joke for sequel titles. Um, House 2, the second story. Um... The question I did ask last week is, what's your favorite anthology sequel or sequel in name only? Um, and there's a, there are a few that I like. I like, ha uh, of course you know, I love Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. And I also really, really like Prom Night 2 Hello Mary Lou, which is infinitely better than Prom Night. Prom Night is a terrible movie. Prom Night 2? Actually pretty good. Abby once again coming through for me, answering the question. Uh, she said, Troll 2 and Titanic 2. Which, Titanic 2 is not even a, a sequel in name only. That's a fake sequel. Troll 2, okay, I'll give you that one. Great movie. Um, Titanic 2 I thought was kind of boring. I don't know, I've thought of reviewing Titanic 2 in, like, fake sequel month or something. House 2, the second story, however, is basically the only anthology movie I think works because it is... It is different characters. It is a separate story from the first film, but it doesn't feel that different. It feels like it takes place in very much the same universe. It has a very similar tone, a very similar story. Uh, the house has very similar properties to the one in the first movie completely unlike house three which is a sequel in name only it was called like the last horror show or something i think that's wrong the the last horror show is something different but it's it's something like the horror show some really generic title like the horror show and then the producers bought it and were just like nope it's House 3 now. Slap the House 3 title on it. And then, uh... House 4 is a direct sequel to the first movie. Which is so weird, because you have House, and then you have two unrelated House movies. One of which was not even written to be a House movie. And then suddenly you go back and do a sequel to the first one. Um, my understanding is that it's very insulting to the first film. But it's also kind of funny bad. Maybe we'll watch it someday, maybe we won't. In House 2, the second story, there's another writer. This time not a novelist, this time an architect, uh, no, archaeologist. Not an architect, an archaeologist, uh, who writes for this, like, archaeology magazine. Um, moves into this house that, like, his great-great-grandfather built... And it's very weird, like, the... It's a very... Like, like on, from the outside, it looks like the spooky house from the first film. But for some reason, like, the entire first floor... live Like, not living room, like, the, the grand entry to this house has, like, this Aztec design. <laughs> Which uh, it makes sense. His great-great-grandfather was... Also sort of an architect, or, or an explorer at least, and he 
he recovered a lot of artifacts from, you know, the Aztecs and the, the whatever other Native American tribes he could find. Uh, among them, he found this crystal skull that is really fucking... It's, it's solid crystal in the shape of a skull. Uh, much better Indiana Jones movie than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Figuring that his grandfather was somehow buried with the Crystal Skull, uh, Jesse goes out and digs up his... I, I forget how many greats they say, but most of the movie they just call him Gramps, so I'll say his grandfather. He digs up his grandfather's grave and... They throw off the lid and his grandfather is still alive! <laughs> His grandfather is a zombie. He's got some uh, voodoo magic on himself to make himself still alive. And he's been waiting 70 some odd years for someone to come along and dig him up. So Gramps is still alive. Uh, and I, I think he does have the crystal skull right off, but... Then, as soon as, like, they bring the crystal skull into the house, weird shit starts happening. So, like, a caveman from prehistoric times, who for some reason looks like a WWE wrestler, he's got, like, ultimate warrior makeup. <laughs> he shows up and steals the skull and, like, runs back to prehistoric times. So they have to travel back to prehistoric times. The house can time travel now, and they get the skull back from there, and then there's a whole thing with, uh, like, you know, you know, like some Aztec ritual where they're about to sacrifice a virgin, and they have to get the skull from those guys, and then finally, uh, Grandpa's old partner shows up, and they have to fight Grandpa's old partner. So, in a lot of ways, very similar to the first house, although... Much goofier, much sillier, much more of a comedy. Um, not really that many horror elements outside of, like, Grandpa and his partner are both zombies. Um, other than that, pretty normal. Pre pretty, it's more like a fantasy movie than a horror movie. Still, it's it's pretty funny. There are a lot of very funny moments in it. Um, uh, the, the errors stick out a lot to me on a rewatch, um, cause there's just stuff that doesn't make sense. Like, okay, so, Jesse and his wife move in, and then Jesse's friend and his girlfriend show up because his girlfriend's a singer, and Jesse's wife works for a music label. So they're kind of trying to get in good with her so she can land a music re uh, a music record deal. But Jesse's friend like throws a Halloween party and it's the the sitcom misunderstanding. She thinks Jesse's cheating on her. And at one point, she gets mad, and she storms out, leaves with her boss from the record company. Played by Bill Maher. Bill Maher's character is supposed to be, like, this really douchey guy that we're not really supposed to like. Who's like, it's obvious he's trying to come between Jesse and his wife. Um, and there's just something so naturally hateable about Bill Maher. Like, he shows up, and you're like, yeah... I believe him as a horrible douchebag. He is a very unlikable person. This is good casting. But, like, at some point he's trying to convince them of the house's magical powers, and things go wrong, and his wife storms out and leaves with Bill Maher, and then his friend's girlfriend also leaves, even though there's... I, I don't know why. She, she gets mad at her boyfriend and leaves. But he's not the one that they think is cheating. So what's she upset about? But then those three characters never show back up. They're just gone from the movie. Which is so... That's... That, that was bad. That's a bad writing thing. They should have been... 
either reincorporated into the film, or they should have been dropped from the film entirely. Because they never show up again after that point. And then the ending's really weird. And I think maybe that's part of what makes their disappearance so weird. Like, if she'd come back at the end or something, it would have made sense. But the ending is like, the house explodes, and they end up back in, like, the Old West with with Jesse's grandpa. Like, when Jesse's grandpa would have been alive. Which makes no fucking sense. I don't know how that happened. There's also... that That's just how it ends. That's That's the resolution to the plot. And there's this, like, underlying implication that Jesse is somehow his own great-great-grandfather? Because he's named after his great-great-grandfather. They're both named Jesse. So now he's back in cowboy times when his grandfather was alive. Is he now, is he now the Jesse that he is named after? I, did he just create a time paradox? Is his friend the the evil partner who was who This is in the first scene of the film. The first scene of the film, Grandpa's business partner shoots Jesse's mom and dad. Is his friend from this movie supposed to be that guy in the future? Weird. It's weird. I still enjoy it. I I'll, I'll still go out and say like, "No, I enjoyed this film. It's fun." It has massive issues. The first movie had George Wint of Cheers. So this movie has John Ratzenberger. John Ratzenberger is the funniest part of this fucking movie. He plays this electrician. Because uh, they're, they're having like electricity problems in the new house. So he shows up and he breaks a bunch of shit. And he's just like, eh, don't worry about it. And then he like cuts a hole in the wall and that's how they get back to like the ancient Aztec times it's like a like there's like a time portal in his wall and John Ratzenberger is so nonchalant about it he's just like oh yeah seems to be some uh, portal to another dimension in your wall he's the funniest character the movie's worth watching just for that scene with John Ratzenberger it's fun I enjoyed it I recommend it. Um, it's very tame. Like I mentioned, it doesn't really lean into the into the horror elements. I was shocked to learn this was a PG thirteen. But after rewatching it, I think this could have passed for PG if it had come out just a little earlier in the eighties. This would have been like a PG. Like it, it's it's that tame. I say it's that tame as if 80s PG is tame. It's like Poltergeist got off with a PG, and that has like a guy ripping off his own face. I don't know why Poltergeist got a PG. Poltergeist should have been R. So next up we watched the two Ghoulies movie, uh, the first two Ghoulies movies. There's four of those. Um, again, maybe we'll watch three, probably not going to watch four. So... Ghoulies 1 is about this kid who he's the son of this satanic cult leader, but like his caretaker like takes him away, protects him from like the occultist life, and when his father dies, he inherits his father's huge mansion full of like ancient evil spell books and stuff. So in a lot of ways, it's the perfect movie to pair up with the house of the first two house movies. Because it's also about someone inheriting a mysterious creepy house from a dead relative. So he invites a bunch of his college buddies over, because he's in college. He invites a bunch of college buddies over to his new big mansion house. And they have a big house party and they're like, oh, we should play a game or do something. And he's like, I know. Let's perform a ritual. Because there's all these books on, like, satanic rituals. So they're like, yeah, let's do a ritual. But, like, his friends don't take it seriously. And then they, they start to leave. And he's like, wait, I didn't dispel the spirit. And they're like, ah, whatever. 
But that, it's sort of implied because of that. He is, like, possessed by his father. So then he gets really into, like, the occult and the the rituals and the, the, the magic. And he summons the ghoulies, who are supposed to be, like, his satanic servants. And he, he summons these two dwarves, uh... Who do a lot of the busy work for him. And then he invites all of his friends back over. Uh, to get killed by the ghoulies for a ritual that will resurrect his father. Um, he doesn't know that. He's surprised when it resurrects his father. And he's like, oh no, my dad's here. And he's like, his dad's like, ah, I was in charge the whole time. It's my evil doing. And... Then, in a really anticlimactic twist, um, his old caretaker, who was not in the movie up to that point, he's in the opening scene taking the kid away from the Satanist, and he has a little bit of narration at the beginning. Other than that, we have not seen him in this movie, and then he just shows up. He's just like, oh, I'm here to save you, and he saves the day. The end. I was kind of surprised how much this film leaned into the satanic elements because I browse lists of satanic movies, like popular or like bad, unpopular satanic movies, and like none of them have ghoulies on them. But this is like blatantly a satanic film. It's it's not even like oh, there are creatures in it that it's revealed are satanic. No, this is full-on, unmistakably, a satanic horror movie. Um, I expected it to be a little more like Gremlins. Because this came out the same year as Gremlins. So I expected, like, the ghoulies to be running around doing, like, evil, tiny creature hijinks. And there wasn't really a lot of that. There was some... There was a bit, but not, not, it's not like Gremlins. Not really like Gremlins at all. I feel like the marketing is kind of deceptive. Like, it leads you to believe it's this small creature hijinks movie. Because even the poster has, like, this, the creature coming up from the toilet. And the tagline is like, They'll get you in the end, implying that these are monsters that are going to come out of the toilet and eat my ass. That doesn't happen in this movie. He does come out of the toilet, to be fair. He comes out of the toilet, but he doesn't attack anyone. He just, like, climbs out of the toilet. The stuff about it I enjoyed, but overall... Eh? I'm on the fence. It's not great, but, you know, if you're looking for a fun little... Uh, like, cult horror movie, and by cult I don't mean satanic occult. It is that. If you want, like, a satanic occult movie, but I mean, like, cheesy, goofy B-movie type thing. Yeah, this is a, a fun one, but not the best. It's fun. Produced by Empire Pictures, Charles Band's uh, studio from before Full Moon, when he could make good movies. You know, he produced Reanimator, one of the greatest films of all time. And then he did Full Moon. How, Charles Band, how? Uh, the main character looks like he's played by Eric Roberts, to the point that I had to double-check that it was not Eric Roberts, and I'm still not totally convinced he's not. Uh, directed by the director of Rockula. I think I like Rockula better. I think if, uh, if you put these two movies in front of me, I'd put Rocky Law on and watch that. So then we watched Ghoulies 2, and I feel like Ghoulies 2 was sort of meant to address the criticisms about it not being a goofy creature hijinks movie. Because Ghoulies 2 is much more of a goofy creature hijinks movie. Um, even, you know, I mentioned the no one came out of the toilet to eat someone's ass. That does happen in this movie. One of the the thing that comes out of the toilet 
does attack someone when he sits down on a toilet. So, uh, Ghoulies 2, the Ghoulies, like, it starts with, like, this old man trying to destroy the Ghoulies. I don't know who the old man is. It's not important. He's trying to destroy the Ghoulies, but the Ghoulies kill him instead. And then they run around this fairground, causing hijinks. Uh, in particular, they, they take up residence in this, like, haunted house. It was called, like, the Devil's Den. Um, and Devil's Den has sort of been losing money because it's not a very good attraction. It's not very scary. But then all of a sudden they have the ghoulies in it, and the ghoulies are making them loads of money. Uh, at some point in this film, uh, like, the fair owner has taken over the haunted house from the people who typically run it. So, Ghoulies 2 is, by and large, the story of a business owner who decides to keep a business open even though it is potentially deadly, because it is profitable to do so. That's just a little too relevant for me right now. I know, I know, it's it's the thing Jaws did, right? Jaws did this much better than Ghoulies 2. But still? But still. Uh, I, I do like Ghoulies 2 more than the first one. I said last week I'd heard more recommendations for the second one, and yeah... Yeah, the second one, uh, a lot more creature hijinks, a lot, a lot more people die in the second one. It's so, okay, okay, in the first one, like, the ghoulies are going around attack attacking all of the main character's friends. And it looks, it seems like they're all dead, they've had, like, their throats cut and stuff, and so they're, but th then in the end, like, they've taken the dead bodies down to where the ritual should be. And after the caretaker comes in and attacks the main character's dad, all of them just, like, heal up and are fine. The movie ends with all of them alive. So the body count for Ghoulies 1 is, like, 3. And it's much higher in Ghoulies 2, so I appreciate that. So in many regards, yes, Ghoulies 2 is the more fun of the two films. I still don't know that I would fully recommend it, but... You know, again, if you're looking for a fun little cult movie, Ghoulies 2. It's fun. I enjoy it. There's a character in the film named Miss Le Fay. She's sort of like the main female, in the back half of the film at least. Miss Le Fay. And I almost wonder if that is not a reference to... Church of Satan founder Anton LaVey. Because, you know, there is the whole satanic angle to the ghoulies. They are a demonic entity. So, I wonder if that's a reference? I would guess not, but it might be. It's close enough that I'm like, maybe. Maybe. It could go either way. I'm 50-50. So my question for you this week is... What's your favorite Japanese horror movie? Excluding Kiaiju. We will get to the Kiaiju. Don't tell me Godzilla. Give me, like, Ringu or something. You know? Like the, the Japanese ghost movies or whatever. How is it they're always mowing on the day I'm filming? This is not my usual filming day. They just knew. They just knew somehow I was filming on not my normal filming day. And they're outside mowing today, instead of the usual day. So this week, not only do we have a Japanese horror triple feature, it's a Criterion Japanese horror triple feature. So we're going to start by finishing the house movies. Uh, by that I don't mean watching House 3 or House 4, The Repossession. I mean watching Houseu from 1977. Let's see if it says on the back. 77. Then from their uh, Eclipse series, when horror came to Shochiku, we've got Goke, the body snatcher from hell. And finally, we've got Jigoku. 
alternatively titled Sinners at the Gates of Hell. Um, although Jigoku, to my knowledge, just means hell. So you might also find it under the title Hell. Um, so Hell, Sinners at the Gates of Hell, or Jigoku. My copy is just called Jigoku. <laughs> we'll be uh, watching those tonight, and we'll be back next week with some more Matt Presents.